Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little personal story here. Like back in the day, about like five, six years ago, uh, around the time when I met Nate, actually, I worked as a, uh, a data buyer. Uh, that was like one of the hats that I was wearing in this innovation lab at a, um, at a pension fund. And I remember back then, um, you know, I, my job was basically to like find like 20 different alternative data sets and test them with, with our um, uh, portfolio teams. Um, you know, some were interested in commodities data, others were interested in more, uh, you know, fixed income uh, oriented data. But the point was I had to basically contact 20 different um, alternative data firms and figure out how to work with them, how to get access to the data, where to place the data so that it's accessible to uh, this team of portfolio managers who were going to test it. And I remember being very, very overwhelmed by the task. We definitely did not have the right tools in place at the time to, um, to be able to scale something like that. And times have definitely changed, right? The tools are available, as, as we all touched on. Um, but it seems like the appetite for data is also kind of insatiable. Like, there's just never enough alternative data sets. Um, so from your perspective, where are you seeing the most um, interesting demand in that space? Like, what are, can you give me some examples of, uh, you know, data sets that customers are asking for? I mean, whether they're custom ones or whether you have to go out there and find them for them. Um, so, like, how are you seeing the demand for alternative data um, change over, over the last few years? Eddie? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll touch on one that came up more recently that seems to be in high demand. It's, it's uh, crypto order books. So, um, it's stuff that, that the only way you have it is you've, you, were, you began collecting it many years ago, and now you have like a treasure trove of historical order book data, which people can do back testing on and things like that. Um, so we, we made an investment in Amber Data, uh, which is a, is, is a company that basically did just that. It's a pretty good idea. I, I wish I'd thought of it many years ago, but um, th essentially they just collect order book data from all the, all the different exchanges and, and depth as well and offer it as different products. Um, obviously the retail order flow data that we talked about earlier is interesting. Um, another thing that we're seeing is, is people having more interest in the commodities uh, lo logistical process. So looking at like ports and density of ships and ports. Um, I don't know if you heard recently, but, but we got cut off from this data, but um, ch the Chinese trucking data. So, so data and in, in like looking at Chinese highways to see if the trucks are there and to see if like the, um, the, the, the cities have opened up yet, basically. Um, but yeah, those are the themes that we've, we've been seeing. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Nate? So, you know, I think that uh, one of the most important trends we've seen is that alt data has, has, has become a key component in investors' mosaic that they put together to, to try and drive their ability to, to predict where earnings are gonna come out. You know, when I started in the business you know, 20 years ago, uh, we were flying all over the world, talking to people, trying to get an, a, an understanding of where orders were gonna come out. And, and today, you're able to pull data points like geolocation data. You're able to pull data points like, like credit card receipts uh, to really get a good understanding of where a number might be be coming out before it actually comes out. And that trend has really driven alt data to the, to the forefront. You know, when you're able to explain a stock price movement based on the release of, of, a, of a data point like that, uh, you know, it becomes mainstream. Everyone wants to, to get that data. Uh, for us, you know, we're more on the forefront uh, of helping customers scale human intuition, help them scale their insights by being able to to, to take something like um, like sentiment across earnings calls and be able to measure all the companies in an, er, in a, in an industry and find an outlier. Uh, we help use uh, different techniques to understand uh, when a company might be uh, on roller skates versus the analyst community. We call it deception, but what it really does is, is measure when a management team either can't or won't answer the questions uh, that the analysts are asking them. Uh, and being able to, to create those types of data sets uh, that can let an investor find something that they might miss. Maybe they have three earnings calls on at that same point in time and can't listen as, acute, as acutely as they'd like to. 
uh, and we help them flag those outliers so that they know when they, they should take a deeper dive. And you know, for more quantitative clients, you know, there is a statistic, there is a, a, a verifiable source of alpha in these types of data sets. Awesome, and I, I do remember actually, even like during, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, you started tracking like COVID sentiment as well. So you've been quite responsive to, you know, events that are happening, uh, you know, in the world. Like, can, can you just give us a couple more examples? I know you have them. Oh yeah, um, well, inflation for us is a, is a, you know, is a, is a real bonanza because, you know, I mentioned pricing power before. Well, inflation is great for a company that has, has pricing power. Take, uh, take Mercedes-Benz as an example. They're able to raise prices in advance of, uh, of, uh, the inflationary pressure that they're that they're seeing, so it's actually leading to margin expansion in the, in that case. And what we're able to do is identify those companies that are talking most positively about pricing power, and conversely, identify those that are talking most negatively about about margins or about uh, or about about pricing pressure themselves. And then you can do that to create indices. You can create. Uh, all sorts of, of rankings of stocks, either to dig deeper or to create trading strategies around those, and those have shown to be very profitable. So, you know, when an issue comes up, if you if you if you think about how would I want to capture it, how would I want to capture the companies that are that are talking most uh, aggressively around competition uh, in these times, we can help you create those types of of screens or even index index uh, type of selection mechanisms in order to capture those those companies. Awesome. So anybody who may care about inflation, go and talk to Nate after, <laughs> after the panel. Um, Anthony, from your perspective. Yeah. So uh, several several years ago, Morningstar acquired PitchBook, right? And PitchBook's been in an incredible business and growing really fast. So with with their lens on the market, right, we can cover uh, a company from seed round funding through all the fundraising series. Uh, through IPO, and then with Morningstar, you're covering them from a public equity side. So, you know, we, Mor Morningstar, you know, data is at the foundation of everything that we do. Uh, we have lots of alternative data sets. Uh, even when you think about our um, managed investment database, right, which is how Morningstar started, right, providing transparency on mutual funds where there wasn't really any uh, light being shined. Um, and, and that's how we got started. Even that database today is still growing at 11% clip year over year. So we're talking about 11% for the next five years. Um, and we're looking at somewhere between um, the next three and five years, we'll have uh, roughly a million different products uh, for an investor and advisor to build a portfolio from. So that's just so much data. Uh, a lot of that is alternative data sets. Uh, but we're not just thinking about alternative data. We're also thinking about alternative services. Uh, so from an advisor's perspective, and Morningstar reaches 180,000 advisors across the U.S. and Canada, um, you know, how, how do we build uh, services around their core business? Uh, so maybe their family office, of course, they maybe interact with Morningstar for research and proposal generation, client communication, building portfolios, but what else can we do to help them kind of further that along? Uh, so we've partnered with Luma Technologies. They're a structured products data provider so that an, invest, an advisor can build a portfolio around structured products, make proposals, see how those interact with their uh, existing models. Uh, we've also built connections to uh, mortgages, so mor mortgage origination, lending, refinancing. These are skills that will be brought to the advisor. And then we'll be announcing some partnerships in the crypto TAMP space uh, so that an advisor or family office can allocate into uh, in crypto. 